Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Church Online. It's so good to be with you this morning. I want to say a special welcome to all of our first-time guests. If you're joining us for the first time today, my name is Jeremy. I'm the lead pastor here. We're so glad you're with us today. Welcome to all of you on this second week of Advent. Now, let me just take a moment to talk to you about this season because Advent is really a season of preparation. We're preparing our hearts to celebrate the birth of our Savior in just a few weeks. And I really want to encourage you to make Advent a season of worship. You know, the word Advent, it's actually Latin for the word coming. Here's what we do at Advent. We remember Jesus' first coming, which we celebrate the very first Christmas. We also look forward to the fact that Jesus will come again, just like he promised. But this is also a season where we open our hearts to Jesus coming to us afresh. So I really want to encourage you, make this a season of worship these next few weeks. This is not a season of stress. This is not a season of anxiety. This is not a season to max out your credit cards and be materialistic. No, no, no. This is a season of love and joy and peace. And so I really want to encourage you, let's be intentional. Can I just tell you that Christmas music is some of the best worship music, some of the best worship songs ever written. Come on, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Put some Christmas music on, worship around your house, prepare your heart and watch the difference it makes in your life. So today we're continuing our Advent series. And what we're doing in this series is we're looking at the Christmas story from the perspective of the different characters. You know, this is the time of year when we open up the Gospels, and we read the Christmas narratives and the familiar names and characters like Mary and Joseph and the wise men and the shepherds, the characters that we see depicted in in the Nativity. So last week we looked at Mary. This week we're going to look at Joseph. We're going to encounter the Christmas story through the perspective of Joseph. And here's what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about hearing the voice of God in the midst of all of the noise. Come on, how many of you ever feel like your life is really noisy? You know, in the Ziegler home, we feel that way sometimes. We actually work out of our house. So my office, my church office is in the basement. And Amy usually works upstairs, usually at the dining room table or in her bedroom. And these days, our three boys are home a lot more often than they used to be. Uh, Due to COVID, uh, their school district is doing hybrid schooling, so they're home every other day. And sometimes our house gets noisy. The other day, I was trying to say something to Amy. I was yelling to her from the basement, and Michael had the TV blaring, and Nicholas was banging on his drums because we thought it would be really wise to get Nicholas a drum set. Yeah, I don't know what we were smoking. But anyway, sometimes our house is noisy, and I'm trying to yell to Amy, and we're just trying to have a conversation, and I feel like the Grinch in Whoville, all the noise, noise, noise. We can't even hear each other. Let me ask you this question. Do you ever feel overwhelmed by the amount of noise in your life sometimes? Come on, anybody ever feel that way? The amount of voices, the amount of information that's constantly bombarding you, all of the opinions that are always in your face on social media, like our lives can be noisy. We live in the age of information overload. We got 24-7 news coverage. Come on, COVID is always in our face. Some of you need to turn the news off, by the way. We got social media. We got phones. We're walking around with phones that are buzzing with notifications all day long. It's information overload. And, And sometimes it leads to us really being stressed out and overwhelmed and anxious and we have mental fatigue. Come on, we don't suffer we don't suffer from a lack of voices in our lives. We've got way too many voices in our lives. And so today in in our story in our text today, uh, Joseph finds himself in a situation where he has a really big decision to make and he's got to sort through all of the noise of the voices in his own head. Come on, how many of you know sometimes the loudest voices are all the voices that we have swirling in our own minds, in our own heads? And so let's look at this. Last week we we took a look at Mary's story and how the angel Gabriel appeared to her in what we call the Annunciation, where he announced this news to Mary that she, the angel Gabriel told Mary she was going to give birth to the Messiah, to the Savior of her people. And of course, this was really overwhelming news because she was just a young virgin, just a young maiden. And so she got this really big news dropped on her. Now, here's the interesting thing. What we don't see is what it was like for Mary to share that news with Joseph. We don't, we don't have this in the scriptures. How would you have liked to be a fly on the wall in that conversation? 
hey, Joseph, you might want to sit down. I've got some really big news for you. Uh, I'm pregnant, and it's by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and Joseph's like, yeah, I think I'm going to need some time to process this and probably a really stiff drink. Imagine what that conversation was like. Well, we're going to pick it up today. We're going to continue our story in Matthew chapter 1. Let's look at Matthew 1, verse 18. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. So Joseph and Mary, they were engaged. But there's one thing you have to understand about engagements in biblical times during the life of Christ. They were a really big deal. In fact, an engagement was a legally binding agreement, much more serious than our modern day engagements. You know, if you decide not to get married, you can break it off here. You can have your ring back, whatever. But back then, this was, this was a big deal. This was a legally binding agreement that could only be broken by death or divorce. It was much more like, like marriage. So here's Joseph. He hears this really big news. And imagine how he felt at this time. Like, you know, if I stay engaged to this girl, what is everybody going to think about me? Because in Jesus' time to be, you know, pregnant out of wedlock, that was a huge deal, a, a big disgrace. And so here's Joseph, like, what's everybody going to think of me? Are they going to think this is my baby? You know, what are my parents going to think about me? What are the other people in the village going to think about me? And, and in his mind, like in his perspective, he's marked for life with this shame. You know, if I stay with this girl, people are going to wonder if I got her pregnant out of wedlock lock or, you know, what am I doing marrying this girl that got pregnant by someone else? And if he divorces her, like what father is going to bless their daughter and give her to me in marriage? I mean, this is a really big deal that's weighing on his heart and mind. And so he's got all of these voices swirling in his head. You know, what are people going to think about me? And, and how is this going to affect my future? What should I do in this situation? Come on, how many of you have ever felt that way before in life? You were trying to sort it out and there were all of these voices all of these opinions, all of these things going through your mind. Have you been there before? I think most of us can relate to Joseph. And so Joseph decides he's going to move on. He's going to break off the engagement. Let's look at it. Verse 19, Matthew 1, 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So Joseph decides he's going to break off this engagement. He's going to divorce Mary, but he's going to do it quietly and privately. He shows mercy to Mary, even though it appeared that she had dishonored him. Now, you have to understand that Joseph, according to the Old Testament law, he could have had Mary publicly judged and stoned to death. I know that sounds terrible, but if you read the Old Testament, this was the Old Testament way of doing things. Come on, how many of you are thankful that we live under the New Testament, under the law of Christ, under the law of grace? And so Joseph is compassionate, but he decides it's just going to be a lot easier and simpler to break off his engagement to Mary, let her go quietly. But Joseph was about to learn a really important lesson. And here it is. You can put it in your notes. One word from God can change everything. Come on. How many of you know that? One word from God can change everything. Joseph was about to get a word from God that was going to change his life. See, we read this story, and, and we know it from our perspective because we know how the Christmas story plays out. But you got to remember that Joseph was living this and experiencing this in real time. And one word from God can change everything, and it was about to change his life. Let's look at it. Verses 1, verses uh, 20 and 21. Matthew 1, 20 through 21. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David... Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream and says, don't be afraid. Don't let fear overwhelm you. Take Mary as your wife. Stick to the plan. Trust God, because indeed what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she's going to give birth to, to the Savior, to the promised one, to the Messiah. What made the difference in this story? What made the difference in Joseph and Mary's life? What makes the whole difference in the Christmas story even happening? Joseph heard the voice of God. And one word from God can change everything. One prayer 
one scripture, one sermon, come on, one worship song, one prophetic word spoken over you by another believer, one whisper of the gentle voice of the Holy Spirit in your life can change everything. Should I make this move? Should I take this job? Should I invest in this opportunity? Should I make this purchase? What should I do? One word from God can change everything everything. Some of you, you're in a totally different place in life right now because you were at a crossroads. You had a decision to make and you heard the voice of God and it changed everything. Some of you, it was just a simple thing, just everyday simple decisions you've learned to tune into the voice of God and it's changed your life. And so here's the thing, if one word from God can can change everything, what do we do about that? Because it's kind of a big deal. Well, if one word from God can change everything, then you better learn to hear the voice of God. We, we got to develop this ability, cultivate this ability, this gift of tuning into the voice of God, being able to hear his voice on a regular basis. Now, I know some of you are thinking right now, what are you saying, Pastor Jeremy? Like, is God going to speak to me in an audible voice? You know, it, you know, this is hearing from God. Like, that's something reserved for really holy people, really special people. Like, I don't know, Joseph and pastors and missionaries. No, no, no. This is something that God wants for all of us. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the very spirit of the living God on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit came to live within you. God wants to speak to you. God wants to have this kind of relationship with you. This is is for all of us. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a few moments and we're going to look at a few principles that we can learn from the life of Joseph about hearing God's voice. So I want to invite you to take some notes, all right? Really good opportunity. Open up the Redemption app and there's a spot there where you can take notes or use your phone. Whatever you want to do, write it down in your journal. But let's, let's look at some principles, some things that we can learn from Joseph about hearing the voice of God. Are you ready? Here's the first one. Number one, your ability to hear God's voice depends on your availability to hear God's voice. Come on, let me say that to you again. Your ability to hear God's voice depends on your availability to hear God's voice. Now, oftentimes we read the Christmas story and we focus so much on Mary that we forget totally about Joseph. I mean, let's be honest, Mary's kind of a big deal. You know, she said yes to the immaculate conception. Like, even though I'm a young maiden, just a young virgin, yes, I will give birth to the Son of God. Like, Jesus, the Son of God, lived in Mary's womb for nine months. She's kind of a big deal. And sometimes we focus so much on Mary that we forget all about Joseph. But make no mistake, God saw something in Joseph as well. God saw something equally important in Joseph. He was the kind of man that God could entrust with his son. After all, Jesus, uh, Joseph would be the legally adopted father of Jesus, of the Son of God. It's through Joseph's lineage that Jesus would fulfill prophecy. The scripture prophesied that the Messiah would be a son of David. Well, guess what? Joseph was from the lineage of David. It's through Joseph that Jesus would fulfill that prophecy. Did you know that Joseph was the one who was responsible for teaching Jesus the word of God? Think about that for a moment. Every good Jewish father was responsible for teaching his children, his sons, especially the word of God. Come on, Joseph's carpenter shop was Jesus's Bible college. And and Joseph was also responsible for teaching Jesus the family trait. Joseph was a really important person in Jesus's life. God chose Joseph. He spoke to Joseph because Joseph was available. He was the kind of man who was available to God. He was the kind of man who had made himself available to God and to be used by God. And God saw that very thing in him. And that's why he chose Joseph. You know, some of the greatest heroes of the faith and all of the scripture weren't the most gifted people, weren't the most talented people, weren't necessarily the smartest people. They were just people who made themselves available to God. Come on, think about Moses. Moses was just an old has-been way out in the desert who had thought that his life was completely over when God spoke to him in the burning bush and said, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Come on, Moses was scared to death. Moses had a stuttering problem. He wasn't a very good speaker, but guess what? what? He went. He made himself available, and God used him to deliver the children of Israel from the bondage of slavery. I think about Samuel. Samuel, one of the great prophets, he was just a young boy when God began to speak to him, but he prayed a really powerful prayer. He said, speak for your servant is listening. Come on. He made himself available, and he became one of the greatest prophets in the history of Israel. I think about King David. 
King David was just a little shepherd boy when, when he went down to visit his brothers and there was Goliath who was defying the armies of Israel and David got spiritually indignant and he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine talking trash to my people and my God? I'll go fight this guy. Come on, he was just a shepherd boy, but he made himself available. I think about the apostle Peter. Come on, you ever read about the apostle Peter? He was crazy. He was brash. He was impetuous. He was boisterous, but he said, to Jesus one day, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and I'll follow you. I'm available. And he became the chief apostle, the cornerstone of the church. Come on, some of the greatest people of faith weren't the smartest people, weren't the most gifted people. They just made themselves available. And that's the kind of man that Joseph was. Joseph was available. He was willing to listen. He was able to hear the voice of God because he was available. Can you imagine if Joseph would have been too busy you know, when the angel was trying to speak to him, when God was trying to speak to him, imagine if Joseph was too busy with doing his own thing, worried about his own reputation, worried about building his own life. I don't have time to get mixed up with this girl in this situation. No, no, no. Thank God he was available. Thank God he was, he was available. And so here's my question to you this morning, church. Are you available? Come on, are you available? If God is wanting to speak in your life, can he even find time to get on your, sca- your, your schedule, to get in your calendar in the midst of all of your noise and your busyness and all the stuff you've got going on? Are you available to hear the voice of your Father God who wants to speak in your life? Let me just get practical with you for a moment and talk about how do we do that? How do we make ourselves available? Well, we make the voice of God a priority in our lives. We make the voice of God a priority in our lives. And so it just comes back to the basics, things like, like Scripture, getting into the Word of God, spending time daily in prayer, at least a few minutes in prayer. Come on, spending time in private worship, private worship. Uh, Sunday mornings, being in worship together. Come on, if church is open, I'm going to be there. If church is online, I'm going to be tuned in because it's not optional, it's oxygen. i got to be plugged in. i got to hear the voice of God. How about being intentional about being in relationship? with other believers. We're always talking to you about this. This is why we have life groups and and teams. We want people to be in in relationship. Sure, we're going to have unbelievers in our life, but we're not going to let them influence our heart. The most important voices in our lives are going to be other believers who can speak over us, pray with us, give us good, godly advice. Those are the basics. That's how you make yourself available to hear the voice of God. So let me just give you a really simple prayer that you can pray in the morning when you wake up. Here it is. You ready? God, I'm available. Speak to me. Come on. That's a pretty simple prayer. You can remember that. God, I'm available this morning. Oh, I got a busy day. I got a lot of stuff to do. But God, nothing is more important than your voice. I'm available. Speak to me. Maybe you want to pray the prayer that Samuel the prophet prayed as a child. Speak for your servant is listening. Come on. God wants to speak in our lives. But we got to be available to hear his voice. Here's the second thing. Some principles we learn from the life of Joseph. Here's the second one. Your ability... To hear God's voice depends on your ability to recognize it. Your ability to hear the voice of God depends on your ability to even recognize it when he speaks to you. Now, Joseph had this really miraculous experience, right? Like an angel of the Lord spoke to him in a dream. Wouldn't it be easy if God just spoke to us in an audible voice and told us what to do all the time, right? Like, God, you know, what college should I apply to? God, should I take this job? God, should I make this purchase? God, should I trust this guy? Should I, God, should I, God, should I get into a relationship with this guy? What if the angel of the Lord was like, no, he's a loser. Don't waste your time on him. Come on, how many of you ladies out there wish an angel of the Lord would have spoke to you about that last relationship you got into? Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if God spoke to us that way all the time? But here's the point. How did, Jesus, how did Joseph even recognize that this was an angel, that this was the voice of the Lord? Like, how did he know, like, this wasn't just a bad pizza dream that he had, that this was actually the voice of God? Well, we see a clue in verse 19. Look at this again, Matthew 1, 19. Here's what it said. It says, because Joseph, her husband, was, read this out loud with me, faithful to the law. This is how it describes Joseph. He was faithful to the law. Now, what does that mean? Joseph was a good law-abiding citizen? No, no, no. When you hear law in the Old Testament, in the biblical sense, think, think the commandments of God. In particular, think the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Like, this was like the, the law and the commandments of God, very important to the Jewish people. In other words, Joseph was a man of the Word of God. Joseph knew the Word of God, and the Scripture says he was faithful to it. 
He wasn't just a hearer of the word. He was a doer of the word. Now, I learned something really fascinating when I went on my study tour to Israel two years ago. Uh, during Jesus' time, people didn't go to the local synagogue to, to pray. That's not mostly what they did in the local synagogue. In fact, during Jesus' lifetime, the temple was still standing, so people went to Jerusalem. You made a, pre, a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to pray in the temple. What people mostly did in the local synagogue was read Scripture, read the Torah, study the Torah together. So villages and places like Nazareth and Galilee, which was a good distance away from the temple, they actually needed men who could read and teach the Scriptures. And many of the teachers uh, worked trades half the day and studied scripture the other half the day. They were bivocational, you might say. This is what they did. Now, let me ask you this question. What was Joseph's profession? You know this, right? Joseph was a carpenter. Yeah, Joseph was a carpenter. We read that in scripture. But the word translated carpenter from the original Greek, as the New Testament was written in Greek, is actually the word Tectone. It's the word tectone. A tectone was a craftsman, an artisan, someone who was skilled with building things, uh, with wood and stone. In fact, when I was in the Holy Land, they took us to a village, very, very similar to a village like Nazareth, similar to a village that would have been around in the time of Jesus. And they said, look around. Look at what most things are built out of. Guess what? Almost everything was built out of stone. There was a lot of stone and just a little bit of wood. And so they're like, what do you think Joseph and Jesus most likely spent most of their time doing? So newsflash, Jesus and Joseph were actually just as much masons as they were carpenters. They were artisans. They were craftsmen. They were able to build all kinds of different things. So tectones were actually very, very skilled workers. They weren't just little lowly, sleepy carpenters like Joseph is often portrayed. They were highly respected craftsmen, and they were often just the kind of people who were selected to study Scripture and teach and read Torah in the synagogue. So there's very strong evidence that Joseph was such a man. Are you seeing it? There's very strong evidence that Joseph was prepared to hear the voice of God because he was a man of the Word of God. He recognized the voice of God because he had spent time studying the Word of God. So when he heard God's voice, he knew what it sounded like. He was familiar with his Word. Let me put it to you this way. The voice of God is found in the word of God. And so if you want to know the voice of God, you got to know the word of God. Because how else are you going to recognize it when God speaks? His voice sounds like what we hear in scripture. If it doesn't line up with scripture, it's not the word of God. You may have heard something. You may have been hearing voices, but it wasn't God's voice. Come on, if you want to know God's voice, you got to get tuned into his word. The, the voice of God, the will of God is found in the word of God. So if you want to get more in touch with, with the voice of God, come on, how many of you want that? How many of you really want to know God's voice better? How many of you really want to know the will of God better? You got to get dialed in and tuned into, into his word. Because maybe God is wanting to speak to us. Maybe God is speaking to us, but we don't even recognize that it's his voice when he does. Sometimes we're so tuned into all of these other, other voices that we can't even recognize God, God's voice. Can I just help some of you this morning? I came to church online this morning to help somebody. Some of you got way too many voices in your life, and you need to cut back on some of the other voices so you can get more tuned into the Word of God. Come on, I'm thankful that we can learn from anywhere. It, it, what an amazing world we live in. You can go on YouTube and watch a video and learn about anything. You can listen to a podcast and hear about an expert in any different field. I'm thankful for all kind of voices. Isn't it amazing? we got all kind of people who can teach us things. But let me just tell you something. If what we're hearing doesn't line up with the Word of God, if it don't smell like the Word of God, if it doesn't sound like something Jesus would say, we're letting it go. The voice of God is more important than the voice of Oprah. It's more important than the voice of the recent self-help book that you just read. It's more important than the neighbor down the street and what your sister-in-law thinks. All of those things are wonderful, but we are tuning into the voice of God above everything else. We've got to cut back on some of the voices. We've got to cut back. Our minds and our hearts are too cluttered sometimes with all of these other voices. God wants to speak to us. But here's the question. Are we even going to recognize it when he does? Are we even going to recognize it? Come on. Your, uh, your ability to hear the voice of God, it depends on your ability to recognize God's voice when he speaks. If you don't know where else to start, get back into the scripture. Subscribe to a reading plan on the Bible app. There's so many resources out there. Get your ears tuned back into the word of God. Now, back to our story. We're going to land the plane here. 
So Joseph is about to make a big decision, the biggest decision of his life. And from our vantage point, we know Joseph's about to make a really big mistake in breaking off his engagement with Mary. But the angel speaks. The angel speaks to him and says, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Don't give in to the voice of fear. In fact, what, is, what has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Stick with the plan. Take Mary as your wife. Come on, one word from God at the right time changes everything. And so here's the idea. Put this idea in your notes today. If one word from God can change your life, then learn to listen like your life depends on it. Come on, if one word from God can change your life, then listen. Learn to listen like your life depends on it because your life does depend on it. Your life, in so many ways, your life depends on you being able to know the will and the voice of God. Joseph's life certainly depends on it. Come on, how many of you know that his life would have been completely different? The Christmas story, history, would be completely different if Joseph hadn't heard the voice of God. But here's the interesting thing. God's word didn't necessarily, didn't necessarily make sense to Joseph. Like God's plan, you know, God didn't fill in all the blanks and tell him what was going to happen. He just said, take Mary as your wife. God's word wasn't the most convenient thing to do or even the most rational plan. It probably still made more sense to Joseph to let Mary go, to break off this engagement. God's word wasn't necessarily what Joseph wanted or would have chosen for his life. It's not the way he would have drawn things up, being the legally adopted father of the Messiah. You know, it's probably not what he had in, in vision for his marriage. And so when the word of God came to Joseph, he had to make a decision about what to do with it. He had to make a decision about it. Let me just tell you, the same thing is true for us. And so in one little verse, we see Joseph's decision. We see Joseph's decision. One little verse. Can I just tell you, God is going to speak to some of you. God is going to, to speak to you about some things in, in your life. Maybe he's going to speak to you about some big decisions you're facing right now. Should I make this move? Should I apply to this college young person? Should I take this job? Maybe it's going to be something simpler than that. Maybe God's going to put somebody in your life who needs you. Maybe this Christmas season, God's going to put a neighbor, a friend, a family member in your life, and he's going to be speaking to you about helping that person. Maybe God's going to speak to you about getting on the phone and calling that person you need to forgive. And you really don't want to make that phone call, but you know God is putting it on your, your heart to restore that relationship. Maybe God's going to speak to some of you about, about being generous, being a giver in the Christmas offering this year, like you've never been a giver before. And this is your year to step out in faith and learn to trust God in that area of your life. I, I don't know what it is that God wants to speak to you about. Maybe he's going to speak to you about your marriage, if you're married, or what kind of parent you are. Maybe he's going to speak to you about something in, in your life. And your response might be summed up by just one sentence. So often, people's most important decisions in the Bible, their whole life's purpose is summed up in one simple sentence, one simple verse. And this is what we see for Joseph. Look at this, Matthew chapter 1, 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. One sentence, one phrase, and through one simple act of obedience, the greatest act of God in human history was brought to fulfillment. Come on, you never know how one simple act of obedience, you never know how it can change your life. You have no idea what you set into motion with one single act of obedience. You have no idea how obeying the voice of God just one time, one occasion, how it can change your life completely. I'm telling you, I've seen it in my own life. One word from God has changed everything, and I'm living a completely different life. And so when God speaks to you, and you have to wrestle with it, when his plan doesn't fully make sense, when his plan swims against the current of what's popular in our culture, when his voice requires you to step out in faith, when his voice requires you to forgive someone, when his voice requires you to be generous, when his voice requires you to sacrifice, to give of yourself. My prayer for you is that you can do like Joseph did and you can say, I heard the voice of God and I did what God prompted me to do and it is well with my soul. That's, that's my prayer for you. Come on, we can listen to the voice of fear, or we can listen to the voice of God. We can listen to the, to the voice of 
all the people around us, everybody else's opinion, what people are telling us to do on social media, the prevailing voice of what's popular in our culture, or we can dial in, tune in to the voice of God. Let me just tell you, Advent is a season where we can tune in to the voice of God. It's a noisy season. It's a busy season. It's filled with all kind of plans and shopping and holiday events. And oh, I know it looks different this year, but this can be a season that's really loud. And we're living in a world that's really loud right now, aren't we? A a world that's shouting really loud in so many different ways. But this is a season, church, to cut the clutter, to silence our souls and our hearts and get intentional about tuning in to the voice of God. And so let me leave you with a final question today on this second week of Advent. And here's the question. What difference would one word from God make in your life? Come on, what difference would one word from God make in your life? life? How could it begin to change your daily decisions, your priorities, your thoughts, your habits, the way you treat people around you, the way you treat the people that you love? How could one word from God make you the spouse you've always wanted to be? How could one word from God make you the parent you've always wanted wanted to be, the, the friend, the brother, the sister, the leader, the person that you know God is calling you to be? Come on, one word from God can change everything. We don't have to allow all the voices around us to shape us. God is wanting to speak into your life. You have a purpose. God has a plan. There is great purpose over your life. And I believe God, your loving Heavenly Father, is wanting to speak to you. He's wanting to speak to you. He's wanting to have that kind of relationship with you. And so today we're going to choose to tune out the other voices and tune into the voice of Father God. We're going to ask him to help us to cultivate this gift. And so here's our prayer today, church. Are you ready? It's our simple prayer. Here's our simple prayer. God, I'm available. Speak to me. God, I'm available. Speak to me. Come on, maybe it's just praying the simple prayer that the prophet Samuel prayed as a young boy. Speak for your servant is listening. God, I'm available. God, I'm available. I don't have it all figured out. I'm not the perfect Christian. I, I, I've got some hang-ups. I've got some things I'm still working through, but God, I'm available. If you, can, if you can speak to anybody, God, you can speak to me. Come on, if that's your prayer, would you pray with me? Would you just come into agreement with me as we pray into this together right now? Father, we thank you so much that you are a God who wants to speak to us. You're a God who's still speaking. And God, in this Advent season, as we prepare our hearts to know you better, as we prepare our hearts to celebrate the birth of our Savior, God, we want to hear your voice in the midst of this noisy, busy season of our lives. We choose to tune into your voice today, God, because you want to speak to us. We say, God, we're available. Speak. You're available. Speak for your servant is listening. God, we invite you into our daily decisions, our thoughts, our priorities. God, the big decisions of life and the small decisions of life, the way we treat people around us, God, that big decision that we're chewing on right now, God, speak to us. We're your servants and we're listening. God, give us a love for your word that we would recognize your voice, knowing that one word from you can change everything. Do it in the hearts of your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.